Coming up on the St. Paul Forum, I'll be speaking with St. Paul Mayor Chris Coleman. That's next on the St. Paul Forum. Welcome to the St. Paul Forum. I'm John Forty. With us this week, we are honored to have the Mayor of St. Paul, the Honorable Chris Coleman. Welcome, Mr. Mayor. Thank you, John. It, you've just been elected to your third term. Yes, sworn uh, in uh, uh, January 2nd. Very, very yes. convincing in the election as well. Uh, well, we, you know, we, we took it seriously and we worked hard and, and uh, you know, didn't quite break the uh, Latimer threshold, uh, the Latimer line, uh, but uh, uh, pretty resounding uh, uh, show of support for what we've been doing in the, over the last eight years. And you've got big plans, and we'll go into those plans. But first, let's talk a little bit about how you got here. You grew up in St. Paul, uh, West 7th area? Yeah, well, we were, uh, I always say I was kind of the equivalent of a St. Paul Army brat. We just moved from one neighborhood to the other. <laughs> okay. So, you know, we were in West 7th Street, then we were up on Linwood for a while, and then I moved out to... Uh, Tacoma Park during high school and lived there uh, through the beginning mm -hmm. of law school and then lived in Frogtown and now have been on the west side for uh, over 20 years now. And your father was a famous pol politician. Yeah, he. Uh, I was born uh, the year before he was elected to the state senate and he served from 1962 to 1980 and was the majority leader, the first democratic majority leader in the history of the state senate from 1972 to 1980. Okay, and you have some very accomplished brothers uh, Nick, Notorious who, Brothers. Not anyways, notorious right there, Brothers, you know, yes. Yeah. You got the sweet spot, didn't you? Yeah, some, somewhere along the line. <laughs> okay. yeah. No, I have uh, my oldest brother's Nick, obviously a well-known uh, uh, long-term journalist in the Twin Cities and uh, now doing some things with the uptake, among other things. And uh, my brother Pat is, uh, we call him the good Coleman. He's the one everybody likes. Uh, <laughs> he's at the Historical Society and uh, just uh, a, a guy who knows more about uh, literature, and particularly Minnesota literature, mm -hmm. than uh, almost anyone I've ever met. Uh, my sister Megan is a is a now retired chiropractor, uh, but doing some uh, teaching. Uh, I have a brother Brendan, who is a musician in Prague, and uh, and I have uh, my youngest brother, Emmett, is a, a local uh, government relations person for Comcast. Okay, they're all verbal except Brendan, and I've known Brendan a long time, and. He's astoundingly talented, so uh, he's lifting you all up. Oh, so, uh, Brendan is Brendan is stunning. Actually, I was just thinking about this a lot uh, in the wake of Nelson Mandela's death, when uh, Nelson Mandela was released from prison, and they had a huge rally out at the L.A. Coliseum, hundred thousand plus people. Uh, my brother was one of the musicians that played for for Nelson Mandela. Wow! Uh, and so that's always was a highlight for him. Okay, let's begin the real questions. Okay, um, according to Wikipedia, St. Paul has a strong mayor system. Yes. Is this news to you? No, no, and that's why I spend so much time in the gym. Okay. Uh, you know, you have to live up to that reputation. Yeah. Uh, no, it's actually, that, that goes back to the, uh, to the early 70s. They used to have a charter form of, of, uh, of governance. Uh, the mayor was a weak mayor. George Latimer was the first mayor under the strong mayor system. Uh, and I think, it's, uh, I think it's difficult for a city of any size uh, like St. Paul to have a, uh, a council form of governance or a strong council because at some point somebody needs to be held accountable mm -hmm. and that's what you get with a strong mayor system. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, the saints are coming. The, the saints are moving. Saints are marching How, in. It, yeah, they're marching in. <laughs> yes. How big of a, of a deal is it going to be when they move down here? Well, you know, first of all, let's start with, uh, you know, the Saints have a 20-year-plus history uh, in the city of St. Paul that has been uh, just a, a great pastime. It's a great family venue. Uh, it's a cheap way to enjoy some baseball and uh, not feel like you have to mortgage the house to do that. And, and so it's been great, but their current location is, quite frankly, just it's, it's just uh, abysmal. It's, you know, you have a three- to four-hour inning wait to go to the bathroom and get a hot dog, and, um, and preferably you do it in that order. Um, and, and, but it's just, it, the situation needed to change there. The conditions of the stadium weren't uh, such that you could keep on playing out there. And so what's exciting about it is bringing them downtown St. Paul, uh, having that energy and excitement uh, that will spill out into some of the new bars and restaurants and some of the festivals that we're doing. So 
uh, it just really fits in well with the culture of Lower Town, uh, but does it in a way that kind of keeps the best traditions of the uh, St. Paul Saints. Okay. Um, in your inaugural address, you mentioned your three priorities, which are neighborhoods, economic development through culture and the arts, and the achievement gap. And through lack of planning, I've kind of started here just yeah, with downtown. Yeah, right. And we could keep talking about downtown and then drift through the neighborhoods, and we'd be two hours into this interview. Yeah. But a couple more things about downtown. There's a new bike perimeter path being planned? Well, we, we're putting out uh, for public comment and discussion what has been a lot of thinking around how does St. Paul really have a, a complete network of bicycle uh, paths and uh, you know whether it's a dedicated uh, path or whether it's a shared lane with with cars or just a bike boulevard there's a lot of different pieces of it and it's a 20-year vision that says you know recognizes the fact that a lot of people are depending more and more on their bikes to to get to work uh, it's not just a you know thing that kids ride anymore uh, where the the Twin Cities region you know arguably uh, uh, is even better than Oregon, uh, mm -hmm. Portland, Oregon, in terms of bike uh, cities. Um, and so we just need to make that investment. We need to kind of understand how that fits into a multimodal transportation system. And of course, Doug tying in with downtown is the Green Line and how that's going to affect all of St. Paul. Well, you've already, you've already started to see the impacts of that. Uh, you've seen reinvestment in University Avenue. You've seen the rebuild of the street from, from building facade to building facade. Uh, you've seen people that are looking to do new housing. You've seen kind of a mix of, of old and new. It's really, it's really wonderful. And so all of that is before the line actually starts operating. So uh, the, uh, as, as soon as that line gets up and running, which I've been promised will be at least before the All-Star Game, uh, hopefully be before that, um, you, you're going to just continue to see the growth not just in downtown, but all across the university corridor. Okay, and the, there's a segment near the Minneapolis border that's the new creative enterprise zone. That's part of what the city is planning with, uh, with how culture ties into economic development. A absolutely, and, the, and what's great about that is, you know, that wasn't our idea, that was, you know, somebody saying, wait a second, we got this big project coming through, we've got artists already that are living in, in this community, how do we take advantage of the changes that are occurring, but do it in a way that supports the, the great work that's happening there among the arts community? And, and you see this in, in, in community after community across the country, uh, where there's a thriving arts scene, uh, where there's music and there's vibrancy, uh, that helps attract businesses, it helps attract new residents, uh, it, it, it kind of you know really stabilizes neighborhoods, but does it in a way that uh, makes them fun and interesting. Uh, you're seeing that even down on West 7th Street with the new housing that's going in in the, the old Schmidt Brewery. There'll be hundreds of uh, units of housing for uh, people that are tied in some way uh, or another through the arts, but it's an affordable housing project. Um, and, and you, you know, you think about the transformation that's going to happen down there and uh, quite frankly not unlike what's happened in Lower Town over the last several decades as we've made sure that artists had a permanent place in our community. Um, you know, there's always kind of a, a, a two-stage between long-range planning and short-range implementation. Which is leading, between those two, which is leading right now with the waterfront? Well, I think that's, uh, I think that there's a, a combination of both. You know, we, we look at the, uh, the Great River Passage Plan that has been put together by our Parks and Rec staff, uh, working with folks at the uh, Riverfront Corporation, uh, with a lot of community voices coming together and saying here are some things that we can do immediately to uh, bring people down to the river, uh, to liven things up down there, uh, to preserve open spaces where that, that is the goal. But we also realize this is a 50-year vision. This mm -hmm. is not something that's going to occur in my term or the next mayor's term, uh, but it is a goal to continue, continually sail towards. And, and so you have, to, uh, you have to have a long-term vision, but you have to have some short-term mm -hmm. gains. Now, I mean, you're a master politician. You've got the, the a master. skill. The skill. I, I, mean, I have a master's degree the, the, in the politics. One, the one thing I know is that politicians have an incredible aptitude for names and faces. Um, and so you've got, you remember a lot of that, that retail well, politics. Well, Bob, that's really true. Uh, <laughs> yeah, it's a... um, but so much of politics is about competing constituencies of essentially institutions. You know, money wants this way, money wants that way. And I'm wondering about, like, uh, I'm kind of back to the neighborhoods again. Single stream garbage. We, right now we have independent garbage companies. Would it make more sense to go to a single stream? Well, uh, you mean a, a single pickup? Yeah, uh, yeah. A single, yeah. Well, a single, single hauler single ultimately. Hauler, yeah. Well, you, you know, the, the decision was made in the, in the late, uh, or sometime in the 70s to, to go away from municipal garbage collection. Mm -hmm. um, you know, if I was you know, able to go back in time, would I make that decision? Probably not, because 
there are some disadvantages that occur uh, as a result of that. First of all, uh, there are neighbors, uh, neighborhoods where people aren't getting their garbage collected, which adds to the blight that you see. Uh, if you had a, a city garbage collection, you could just put it on the tax rolls, mm -hmm. uh, et cetera. On the other hand, there are a lot of great small businesses uh, that are dependent upon that. There is some really great innovation that's occurring as a result of some uh, independent uh, garbage haulers that want to do things more sustainably, uh, do things a little bit differently, and those are some of the, you know, that's the advantage of, of the system that you have. And so uh, I think that what we have is the system that we're going to have. Uh, mm -hmm. I know there's some conversations around that, um, but I think we have, we, there are ways that we can do it better, uh, so we don't necessarily have six or seven garbage trucks going down an alley on, on any given morning. Uh, but I think it's it, you know, it's it's hard to go back to the system that we had you know decades ago. Yeah. Okay. Um, I'm going to talk now. I'm going to I'm just going to tell an, I'm going to tell an anecdote about you. My wife Catherine Day, who was the alternating co-host of this show, mm -hmm. brought astronaut John Glenn into town in 2000. I think it was 2006 to give a, yeah. a fundraiser for a nonprofit she was working for at the time, and there were you know five or six hundred people in the Crown Plaza ballroom. And the fire alarm went off, and you from the lead table got up and walked all the way across, went out the door for about five seconds. The alarm went off, and you came back and sit down. It was like magic. It was like you don't need staff. <laughs> well, uh, <laughs> you're, you're sitting next to John and Annie Glenn. Yeah. Uh, you know, two, two American heroes, and, and certainly John Glenn's service to this country. You don't want to disappoint yeah. John Glenn, yeah. and and you sure you know you want to take that opportunity. But I have to say that that was that was truly you know people say well what's the best part of being mayor and and, and there are just moments where you get to assist somebody, you get to help a family, you get to help mm -hmm. a, a, a young child or make mm -hmm. an impression on them that hopefully will stick with them. Mm -hmm. But there's been some some of those moments like uh, Connie and I went home from that dinner that night, and uh, I just said. We just sat with John Glenn and Annie Glenn for three hours. That I mean, yeah. that was just about the coolest thing yeah. I've ever done. Um, but back to your skill in doing that, you, I mean, the city has hundreds of employees, but you only have the power of life and death over a handful of them. Is it like herding cats in that sense? Yeah, I, I, there's there are certain things that I am not able to discuss with you. Okay. Uh, <laughs> you know, these powers that you get when you get sworn in. Yeah. Okay. No, it's. Uh, no, it's it, the, the thing about, and this is why municipal government is so great as opposed to, you know, being out in Congress or whatever, mm -hmm. is it's hands-on. Uh, and you, you know, you, you're in your community, uh, people see you, people know you, um, people expect you to uh, be out personally checking the depths of snow to decide whether or not to plow <laughs> yeah, and, yeah. and those things or flooding the ice rinks, you know, and, and quite frankly, I do a lot of that. And so that's, um, that, that's, the, uh, that's the beauty of this, and it's why people, I think, feel uh, very, very good when they when they spent their years in municipal government and actually get to look back and say, I made a difference. In case you're just joining us, this is the St. Paul Forum. I'm John Forty, and today we have the honor of talking with St. Paul Mayor Chris Coleman. Um, Mayor Coleman, you've just well recently been elected the new president of the National League of Cities. Um, do those other mayors understand the political third rail here of Snow removal. Yeah. Well, some of them do, uh, and some of them have it uh, kind of sneak up upon them because the one thing that uh, mayors know is that if they if they mess up a basic service like that, mm -hmm. they're gone. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And, and if you look at mayors from across the country that have lost their jobs, Greg Nichols out in Seattle, Fenty out in Washington, years ago Byrne in Chicago, mayors across, it, it, it there's always a snow plowing story in there somewhere, <laughs> and so uh, they, I think they understand and appreciate that. Okay. Um, your other two initiatives, I mean, we talked a little bit about neighborhoods, um, and then bringing business to the city through arts and creativity. Um, what can you say about that? Well, I think one of the best things that we've done over the last eight years uh, is to really focus in on the arts and cultural scene in the city of St. Paul. Uh, I brought in uh, Joe Spencer, uh, who was a, a community organizer over on the west side for years. Uh, to say, um, Joe, you know, liven the city up, really mm -hmm. make this a focus. And so as a result of that, we've been able to do some pretty amazing things, like the, uh, the Jazz Festival, which uh, several years ago was going to go away. Mm -hmm. uh, they had some financing uh, challenges. Mm -hmm. And we said, this is too important for our city. You've got to have these kinds of things. And so we worked really hard to keep that. We worked hard to bring in the Amsterdam. We're working to bring in the, uh, the Palace Theater. Uh, which will be an incredible venue uh, right on uh, you know right on seventh place uh, up between Wabashaw and St. Peter. 
um, you know, working in the communities, you know, the, the turf club uh, out on University Avenue. Uh, it's the community festivals. It's all of these things. And, and it's just about people having an attachment to their community, uh, people feeling good about what happens in their city. And when they do that, they continue to invest in it. They want to work here. They want to raise their families here. Um, and, and it just really kind of everything feeds upon another. And so that's why it's been so important to us. Um, a lot of these cultural things are sustainable, and some are kind of intermittent, like the ice castle. I heard you refer to, when's the ice castle coming back? Uh, well, as I say, the, 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 as soon as they pay off the bills from the last ice castle <laughs> several years, uh, they're very expensive to do. My sense is um, the most likely time uh, for for an ice castle would be if the uh, if the new Viking Stadium gets a Super Bowl in, in 2018 as they're hoping to do uh, that would tie into what happened the last time the Super Bowl was in the Twin Cities. Okay, um, the Winter Carnival, uh, the medallion are coming up, um, and it's just it's time to plug them. I yeah, guess. Well, <laughs> well, you know, it's always uh, what I always have to explain to people. The actual the thing that people most associate with the Winter Carnival is the medallion hunt, and that actually is Isn't not an official yeah. carnival event. <laughs> Uh, and, and the other thing I like to say is that the medallion is likely hidden somewhere in my driveway, so, <laughs> so people will come and shovel it out, you know, get, get rid of that ice that's accumulated. Um, but it's really, it's fun, and, and over the last several years, it's really kind of, uh, the, the carnival itself has tried to create new events and new, new uh, things that families are going to partake in. You've all, you have the ice sculptures in Rice Park, which are fantastic. The snow sculptures out in, uh, in, in at the state fairgrounds. You have the uh, the beer dabbler, which this year is going to be out at the fairgrounds. Uh, last year we had during the winter carnival we had crashed ice, but that's actually going to be later in February this year. Um, so we get a couple of bites at at the apple of having great fun in the middle of the winter. Uh, but it's just it's a great tradition. It's uh, it's a part of uh, you know all of us that grew up in St. Paul, but it's a new tradition for families that have just moved here. Uh, crashed ice is 13 months apart. Is that time for you to heal? Are you going to run it again? You know, I, I'm uh, intending to. Uh, I've, uh, I've I've been uh, skating a little bit to try to, uh, to to get my my skating legs underneath me, and uh, um, it's it's absolutely insane, but it's uh, it's it's pretty cool. Um, in the last few days, you have been everywhere. You were on Prairie Home Companion singing to a national audience. You were on NPR this morning, and I heard you talking about your signature initiative, which is the achievement gap, and, mm -hmm. and the, the two schisms of that, the, the income gap as well as the education gap. Right. And I was just, I mean, you know, as just kind of a, a lazy, middle-class, average guy, I, I mean, I think of the achievement gap, well, you know, a lot of poor and minority people started behind, they're still a little behind, it's not that big a deal, at least, you know, in lazy thought. But then two statistics jumped out at me, that white people have twice the graduation rate of people of color, and Half the unemployment rate. Right. Well, for, double double's not yeah. acceptable. No, no. You 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 can't. First of all, you can't have the uh, the achievement gap that we have in in our schools, where the, the the graduation rates, as you suggest, are so significantly different, and not have the other problems associated with it, like the unemployment gap. Um, and and ultimately, it's not a sustainable model. If you look out ten or fifteen years into the into the future in the Twin Cities. There is no way that we can sustain the quality of life, the economy that we have, the Fortune 500 companies that we have, unless we're making sure that every child in our school system has the skill sets that they need to take a job in one of those companies. Uh, it doesn't work any other way. You can't attract enough talent. You know, there, the people are, are competing across the globe for kids coming out of, out of the Harvards and the MITs and the Stanfords and all of those schools. And so we got to grow that talent from mm -hmm. within. And if we exclude people because of their socioeconomic status or their race or their, or their national origin, uh, then we're doing it at our own detriment. And so, you know, 50 years ago when Johnson started the war on poverty, it was kind of a, you know, a moral issue. We didn't, you know, this wasn't the country that we believed ourselves to be where there were kids that were starving. Um, but the fact of the matter is it still is a moral issue, but it is an economic necessity that we close the achievement gap in this country. We've got about nine minutes left, so we can drill down into some of the nuances of this. Um, you've been talking about how important it is just the cognitive development of kids before they're two. They have to hear a lot of words. Well, and this is why I, I, I've taken the role that I have in, the, in our, my administration, which is to say, you know, schools, you know, do what you need to do, uh, Superintendent Silva. Let's make sure we have strong principals, that we have quality teachers, that we have the systems in place there. And let me support that by having systems in our parks and rec system, in our library system, 
uh, working with child care providers to, you know, first of all, have a quality rating system so parents know that those, those children are getting uh, a good education before they start kindergarten. Uh, working with you know community-based providers, we we talked a little bit of, with Mary Brainer from Health Partners to say, is there a way that we can work with your doctors when when moms are coming in for prenatal visits to talk with them about the importance of sitting down with that child even before they can hold their own head up mm -hmm. uh, and reading to them mm -hmm. because kids by the time they're 18 months old, uh, if they're from a, 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 a low-income uh, family or they're from a, uh, they're a child of color, mm -hmm. th their chances are they've had 10 million fewer words spoken to them by the time they're 18 months old. And so they come into kindergarten with, with really diminished um, uh, cognitive or verbal skills, mm -hmm. and you wonder why they aren't reading at grade level by the time they're in third grade. Now, great teachers can play a, a huge part in, in closing that mm -hmm. uh, gap that mm -hmm. exists when they enter kindergarten but it would be so much better and so much easier if that gap didn't exist in the first place. What can be done just at the level of individual volunteers to address that? Well, I think there's a lot of things, and one of my key messages is we all play a role. Don't, don't just say, hey, teachers, that's your problem. You, know, you deal with that. Mm -hmm. So uh, if you're a retiree, go read. Mm -hmm. you know, mentor a child. Uh, I, I've seen some great volunteers that are going in into the schools and it just, it just warms my heart every time I walk into a, uh, an elementary school and I see, I see people that are taking their time to sit with a child, to work with them, to read with them, to just to kind of let somebody, let them know that somebody cares about them uh, and it's critically important. If you're a business owner uh, and working on kind of the college readiness, college and career readiness piece, uh, do an internship for, for a child. We have a program through the City of St. Paul uh, where we are, we're helping companies sponsor uh, high school kids working during the course of the summer. It helps the business, uh, it helps put a little extra money in the kid's pocket, uh, but it also helps them get ready so that they can t ultimately take a job in a professional setting. In that next step, exactly. That yeah. next step. Um, a lot of, uh, you know, local politicians and regional politicians are, are working hand in hand with economic development authorities to bring in new business. But do they, it's just an opinion question, do they spend too much time bringing in new business and not enough time developing what's already here? Well, I think it's a, it has to be a balance. Um, and the reality is most of the jobs in your, uh, in your region are gonna come from growth within the mm -hmm. existing businesses. So a small business that goes from a uh, two person uh, shop to a five person shop is a huge, you know, 150 percent growth, right? Mm -hmm. So that's where you're, that's where the bulk of it is. And so, uh, whether it's Greater MSP, which is a regional economic development entity, or whether it's my planning and economic development department, or the Port Authority, we really understand retention is is, is job number one in terms of job creation. Uh, but number two is to is to create a platform where other companies can come in um, and to identify them, and then have a strategy to go out and get them. One of the things that we realized in the Twin Cities was that for years, we didn't have a, an outward uh, strategy to try to bring companies in. So we fell off the radar uh, for businesses that were looking for a Midwestern location or some other, or, you know, a place to be. And we really realized this was true when Medtronic, a Twin Cities-based company, ended up locating a facility in San Antonio, Texas, having never even considered the Twin Cities, mm -hmm. not because of any factor that they, you know, eliminated us but because we just weren't on the radar. And so, so there was a lot of work that had to happen uh, to change that, and I think that that work is really well underway. Okay, and do you spend a lot of time uh, just coordinating this stuff with other Minnesota politicians? I mean, do you all want to be on the same page? Uh, yeah, well, we, first of all, we have the Regional Council of Mayors, which is a really great uh, uh, networking opportunity. Uh, for mayors, uh, not only of uh, Minneapolis and St. Paul, but uh, many, many of the suburban and exurban communities, um, and that that table is a really wonderful place to have these conversations. And a lot of good work has gone into it, and has, quite frankly, formed the basis for some of the other work that we're doing, like Greater MSP. Um, and and so that happens through you know statewide, uh, and with the work that I'm doing with the National League of Cities, is quite frankly happening on an, on a national scale as well. So it's a uh, it's it's a it's an exciting time. People are realize, realizing that that the local level, you know, you look at Congress and you get frustrated because nothing's happening, but then you look at local communities across this country and you see the incredible transformation of our cities. Uh, you know, some of them have fallen on really hard times, uh, Detroit, for example, but others are just so vibrant, like the Twin Cities, like Denver, like you know, uh, um, 
Dallas, Texas, and you know Portland, Oregon. There's so many great cities that are, are just thriving uh, because municipal leaders are coming together and getting things done. And you know, when you get that few seconds of face time with those key decision makers, do you have an elevator speech? I mean, what what are our strengths? <laughs> Well, first of all, our strengths is that our an educated is an educated workforce. Uh, mm -hmm. There's no question that that's the number one lead that we have. Um, we have a quality of life second to none. Um, we're building out a first class transportation system. We have a hundred different languages spoken in our public schools. Each one of those kids could be an ambassador for a company that's looking to do business internationally. Uh -huh. um, so all of those things are the positives. Uh, when we do the deep dive and we see the challenges that still lie ahead, we have a lot of work on this achievement gap. Uh, we have a lot of work on, on building a more comprehensive transportation network, but pieces are there. Uh, and uh, I've traveled a lot, uh, particularly in my role with the National League of Cities. Uh, I would stack Minneapolis and St. Paul in this region against any other region in this country. Do you get institutional pressure from uh, people that say, let's just lower our wages, let's get them to come by lowering our wages? Yeah. That never worked too well. It doesn't uh, work very well. No, no, and you see that even in in, um, in in companies that have gone overseas, you know, and outsourced their jobs, they're now bringing them back to the Twin Cities or bringing them back to the United States. Manufacturing is actually on the on, on the rise again in the United States because they realize the quality of service, uh, the quality of the of the worker is does matter, um, and more importantly, the quality of life for that worker. Do they have good schools? Do they have clean drinking water? Do they have safe places to live? Those things matter. And uh, you can, you know, uh, trying to be the lowest common denominator has never been about what the city is about, never been what the state is about, and not something that I want to be a part of. Very nice. Um, we only got about a minute left, so a real simple yes or no question. Well, actually, either <laughs> or. Guitar or bagpipes? Uh, uh, guitar is a little bit easier to play at 11 o'clock at night than the bagpipes mm -hmm. are. Uh, I grew up playing bagpipes. and. Uh, um, had a lot of fun with the new standards at their Christmas mm -hmm. show, but um, probably spending a little bit more time on the mm -hmm. guitar now. Um, I was at a funeral, in, I believe it was in Bloomington, maybe four or five years ago, and you were just sitting down the pew, and then I looked and you were gone, and I thought, well, he's the mayor, he's got something important to do, and then bagpipes start, and I look up, and it's you! And it's me. That's very yes, impressive. Yes. <laughs> yes, well, I think, you know, um, it's, uh, it's a lot of fun, but, uh, it, you know, I just, I, I, for me, it's a release. Yeah. And actually, my new thing is I'm, um, trying to learn how to play the trumpet on top of all of those things. So nice. uh, don't ask me why. Okay. Well, that's all we have time for. Mr. Great. Mayor, thank you so much. It was Thanks, really John. a pleasure to have you My here. My pleasure. That's all we have time for on the St. Paul Forum this week. Come join us again next week.